So, Sandeep. Good evening, namaskar, and welcome to this very special day in the history of this historic heritage institution, the Bengal Club. On behalf of the General Committee and the Library Subcommittee, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to this evening's discussion amongst what I can term as the triumvirate of cerebral celebrities we have in our virtual mix today. Whereas none of these gentlemen who you will be hearing for the next hour need to be introduced to a gathering like this one, I have to, in the interests of formality, take the opportunity to welcome and acknowledge the contribution of our own member, Dr. Rudrang Mukherjee, a Calcutta boy from Calcutta Boys School, a former opinion editor and founding vice chancellor of the Ashoka University and currently its chancellor, a professor of history and an author of several books, who has really been the driving force behind this evening's program. The exciting and enthralling events of this evening is in your hands, Dr. Mukherjee, from this point of time onwards. Thank you, Sundeep. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first formal launch of Professor Sen's memoir, Home in the World. And we are deeply privileged to have uh, Gopal Krishna Gandhi to do the launch. And I'm not going to introduce either Professor Sen or Gopal Krishna Gandhi because I don't have the adequate words to introduce them and they don't need an introduction. So Gopal, may I request you to please launch the book and say a few words. You can hold aloft the book so that everybody can see the book and then you can proceed to speak. And after you have finished, Omotoda and I will have a conversation about the book. Thank you very much, uh, it is a great privilege uh, for me to join this, uh, this gathering uh, and to, to, to be in Amartya Babu's presence and uh, a singular honor and a pleasure to hold up this book and hold it, announce its formal launch at this event. I also like to open the first two pages, first two pages of the book. And it's absolutely touching. Very simple dedication to Emma. Amartya Sen is an unusual person. To say that he is an original would be to indulge in a cliche. And cliches and Amartya Sen cannot go together. There is in this book not one predictable phrase. But what is the opposite of a cliche? The opposite of a cliche in ordinary terms would be a shocker of a word, something so utterly outrageous as to shock the reader, but not so with Amartya Sen. With him, the freedom from predictability is not a commonplace outrageousness, but the most gentle and unexpected alternative thought and substitute word, which makes you feel that you have missed something until you have read Amartya Sen. The book is a memoir, so it is about his life, but it is also about his times and his times in all the places that he has been in from place of his birth, to the places where he has grown up with his parents, his grandparents, and the places where he has studied and taught. So it is also about places, as the title itself tells us. It is about places at home, 
where the world is and elsewhere where his home is and he has been very protected his thoughts have traveled his ideas have journeyed and we see in this book a whole host of his observations which are as unexpected as his words are fresh i must say i had read almost everything that has been written about al biruni but i never came across the sentence which omar to babu quotes from al biruni in which, um, which al biruni says indians have a genius for talking eloquently about things on which they know nothing and then he says i will talk about only the things that i know and then in a very typical amotesen self modulation he says not what i know as much as what i have experienced and so this book is about experiences and it is so strengthened by his description of the fragility of ideas including his own because he describes with candor and the most becoming frankness his modification of his ideas in the light of experience i should not take more than 3 or 4 minutes more to say that his critical gaze was anticipated most unexpectedly by gandhi ji in a conversation which amartya sen describes as having taken place in 1945 when he went with his autograph book and the mandatory 5 rupees for the harijan fund to gandhi and after having received the money and signed the book gandhi asked him do you observe things around you critically now that is what amartya sen has been doing constantly including observing his own mind critically now we have a historian program shimukaji with us we have several historians and political scientists and theorists and economists they are an applied and scientists amongst us but there is a a kind of specialization in amartya sen which i have always been aware of but which i have now become totally conscious of like a piece of knowledge in this book and that is that he has a way of spotting even in the most well spotted highly spotted much described much talked about person or thing something slightly unusual which we have missed now for instance in the famous dialogue between tagore and gandhi on the 1934 earthquake when we knew what gandhi had said about this being a divine chastisement and rabindranath having said what rudrangsh has described in his new book on tagore and gandhi as being totally horrified and dismayed by what gandhi has said but then omarta sen gives us a small excerpt from tagore in his discussions on this subject with gandhi which i personally had never come across earlier tagore says if divine chastisement is what has happened why has so much evil around us not been chastised before and then he gives as an example he gives as an example of human folly something which is amazing tagore speaks of the way prisons across the world across the world have become penal houses which in themselves are a form of licensed criminality the god describes prison houses across the world as a form of licensed criminality and says why should this not have been punished by the gods if gods are punishing and 
दो मोर स्मॉल एग्जाम्पल्स सुभाष चंद्र बोस आई हैड फॉर इंस्टेंस मिस्ड रुद्रांशु वुड नॉट है बट आई हैड मिस्ड सुभाष चंद्र बोस इज हरुपरा कांग्रेस स्पीच इन विच ही डिस्क्राइब्स the japanese presence and action during the war as being militarist and imperialist that subhas bose had actually criticized japan not in a common comment but in his presidential address is a nugget of unexpected value likewise and this is my last example that had not fire i did not know until i had come across this totally uh, unanticipated excavation dig radha dino pal apparently called the nanjing massacre by the only names by which it should have been described and he called japanese military excesses devilish and fiendish now we know his descent we know that he had descended in the tribunal but this is a nuance a nugget of a nuance which we find in this book the book is replete with it from page 1 to page last it takes you to places unknown and to places known with a new pair of binoculars and a new telescope which brings into focus what has not been noticed before in connections which have not been made before both when he praises as he praises burma with a passion that is reserved only for places you love but does not hesitate to criticize what has happened to the rohingya under the watch of aung san suu kyi i hail this book as i hail the fact of being a contemporary of one of the most original and refreshing minds of our age omotoda when we go into our conversation and i'm sure in the course of that conversation you we'll have an occasion to respond to some of gopal what some yeah what may i just yes say please say how impressed i am by the orderliness of uh, gopal's uh, understanding of the work and immensely in fact i'm not so far so i have known him for a long time and learned so much from him i think i think of the time when he was uh in uh, bongohoan or is it bongohoan uh, rajbhoan i think uh, rajbhoan in, yes in kolkata and uh those were when i like came in kolkata uh wonderful opportunity for me to learn something from a superior mind which uh Gopal presented to us. So I would like to say how grateful I am that he has taken the time to look at the work and presented some really striking ideas, original and penetrating. Most grateful. Thank you, Amitabh. So. Uh... given that the name of the book is home in the world uh, we cannot avoid rogindrana uh, <laughs> so you know uh, you were 7 when rogindrana died and uh, you still hadn't gone to the school in shantiniketan but you remember the day of his death when it reached your home and you say that you remembered him at that point of time as an elderly man who took a lot of interest in chatting with you or chatting to you 
Do you have any personal memories of those chats? Well, there are memories of uh, being entertained, being uh, uh, intrigued, and, and of course, immensely honored because I did know that the window was for one reason or another. I wasn't absolutely certain what the reason might be. It was one of the great lessons in the world. And the fact that he was taking an interest in asking questions about what did I think about something in Keton? What did I think about going around without shoes and barefoot and so on? It interested me that uh, it is something Rovinath was involved with, uh, even when talking to a what would have been uh, the clear uh, understanding that he is talking to a very young boy. Uh, it was a quite an experience for me. So one person I really want to draw you out on this evening is your maternal grandfather, Shiti Mohan Sen, who is today, unfortunately, a, practically a forgotten figure. Uh, and he was obviously, till you came to Presidency College, and even after that, I think right to your life, he was the most formative influence, intellectual and otherwise emotional influence on your life. And uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about Kitty Boon Shen, about his incredible erudition and his command over languages. And also I have heard from students of Kitty Boon Shen in Shantini Ketan that he was not only a scholar, he was also a raconteur and a, and a great wit. You talk about his gentle humor. And maybe you could talk a little bit about Kitty Mohan Shen so that we can remember him properly. And also in today's context, maybe you could touch upon his really outstanding book, Hindu Mushalmane Jukto Shandhane. Yeah. Well, uh, you're absolutely right that he was a um, tremendous influence uh, in my thinking uh, for various reasons. Let me mention a few. One is that uh, well, he was a religious man in in a very broad sense. Uh, his book on Hinduism, which I which ultimately fell on me to edit uh, for Penguin uh, in English, a subject, a, a language he didn't know very well. I mean, he was, you couldn't beat him in any part of the Sanskrit uh, language or literature uh, from, the, from the Vedic to the epic to the, uh, the classical and so on. But uh, on uh, English he wasn't. But uh, I worked with him. Uh, seeing how his Bengali manuscript could be best rendered into, into English, which required, because I was working with him, uh, getting his permission to make some changes uh, in, in the presentation, which uh, were important uh, for me to be able to do while he was still there. Now, while I'm working on it, I could understand his attitude towards religion. Uh, he was uh, he was quite striking in in a respect that has become uh, quite uncommon in India now. Namely, he had a very positive attitude uh, towards uh, Islamic thinking. And it was um, something that he got as a child. And it originally, I think, came to him from people who had already um, uh, 
uh, tried to put the Hindu, particularly Bhakti movement, with the Sufi thinking in in Islam together. It could be uh, or it could be being one of the very good example of Dadu nearby. But he uh, made a, uh, a, a, a totality of it, which uh, is quite difficult really to, uh, to do because uh, he had a, he had, he had to uh, battle with some people uh, because Kabir was, uh, this is something that uh, I think in the book I attribute a similarity with uh, my friend and your friend, Ranjit Guho, uh, on Subaltern Studies, uh, where he was constantly wide that uh, the, uh, the class bias in what we remember as literature of the period uh, could be very strong. And uh, what happened is that some of Kavi's poems were written uh, and printed in, in, in an established form. Uh, D. Jack and so on. And this immediately took a position that these are the genuine stuff and not the rest, where Kitty Wan Sen was going around from one Kavi cluster of thinkers to another Kavi cluster of thinkers. And they were still thinking anew, sometimes combining a 500-year-old thought with a thought that just arisen among the practitioners uh, in, in, their, in their making of poetry. So there was a need for courage. And of course, he had to pay a price for it because whenever he departed from the printed text, he was told that they're not genuine uh, and because they're not in the printed text, whereas uh, he had to stand up for it. Um, he, um, he did that quite splendidly, but I think there's one thing which I, which became increasingly clear to me, that he found the idea of a Hindu-Muslim relation in the form of tolerance as very defective, very deficient. Because uh, as he put it to me a number of times, that it's not so much that uh, what we are celebrating is that the Hindus tolerate the Muslims and Muslims tolerate the Hindus, but they were creating things together. So it's the joint creation. And that's why uh, when, uh, was it you or was it Bhopal, referred to uh, Hindu, Muslim, and Jukhasarana, that is combined creation of the Hindus and the Muslims. It's the creativity that he was looking at rather than simply tolerating each other. And that's quite remarkable uh, uh, because, and, and, and uh, we see that not only in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, Kabir Fund and the Dadu Fund uh, practitioners, but also at every level of society. For example, it's striking that the first translation of the Upanishad in a language other than Sanskrit, a 
and foam rich, which would actually be in perfume, but uh, it would be foam rich, the, the German, the, the English, and the French translation will be made, was done by Darahiko, uh, the uh, French. And uh, another way of thinking of Darahiko, that he is the son of Mamataz, who uh, was the uh, senior queen uh, of Shadow, and who are in whose memory the Taj Mahal is built. I have often asked this question, uh, can you think of a big building which has been made in the memory of a translator of the Hindu scripture? And the answer is usually not clear what, what could be the answer. The answer, of course, the big building is Taj Mahal because it is Mama Taj who was the mother of, um, uh, uh, of Darasiko, who was the translator uh, from uh, Sanskrit to Persian. Now, I think there are all kinds of but he discusses uh, uh, oh. once, uh, discusses that and he often found it quite striking that that should be the case. But the focus is on creativity, which is very important uh, for him. But it is also a feature which uh, um, I found striking because when I told him that I didn't seem to have any religious faith, uh, and he kept on telling me, well, you come, uh, you, you mustn't have any religious faith because somebody else told you that. Uh, you have to get it yourself, and he will come. And then when I told him that, look, it hasn't come, and it isn't coming because my uh, uh, religious resistance seemed to be growing over time. And then he said, no, you're making a mistake. Religion takes different forms. And what you have done, you have examined these questions. You have taken a position on that and ended up facing yourself in the, uh, uh, in the Hindu spectrum, in the, uh, part of the materialist school of thinking. That's the position that you have chosen. That is a religious position too, excepting it's not one of the standard religions that are uh, educated. So there was a kind of wet of him. I also talked about him when uh, in Trinity uh, College, where I was studying, uh, where I was strongly under the influence of Theodore Schaffer and, and connected with him, uh, Wittgenstein and Ramsey. But in the fact that the Wittgenstein said a number of things, which is a strikingly Gandhian. Uh, um, thinking is incorporated in it. Namely that, uh, of course, I'm successful and so on, uh, but uh, I would like to lead a life which is uh, that of a, a person who has a hard life. And, and when Rovinas ridicules Gandhiji, by saying that the chakra, it, it's a lot of effort and very little uh, result. Uh, and to some extent, that is the point, and with concern is also the thing that I would like to have a life uh, where I would not judge it by the success of what's happening, but by 
in a way uh, we can come to value hard work without it being um, in itself um, uh, seen as being productive. So I think in all these things, I mean, I miss, continue to miss him, and you're all right that even in, in, in my college days in Cambridge, I often wondered whether, I mean, by that time Kitty Monson had, had died, but uh, I often, not when I was first in Cambridge, but during that period, he died. Uh, and I wish he was alive and I could talk with him about uh, these complex things. So I don't know what else to say. <laughs> there is a lot to think about him. So if I could uh, take you away from individuals to two of the more important institutions in your life, uh, presidency and Trinity Cambridge. I think in, if my memory serves me right, in an interview to the Harvard Gazette or something like that, you wrote that when you arrived uh, in Cambridge from presidency, you were surprised that in presidency you had actually been taught more technical economics. I think that's the term you use, more technical economics than you were actually being taught in Cambridge. So how do you think that came about? And was it, uh, was it because of the presence of Tapos Mojundar, who was also a very important influence in your life when you were at presidency and even later? I, I think certainly uh, Tapos Mojundar would have contributed to it. But, uh, you know, presidency college had a tradition of making people uh, in one area of expertise, take an interest in a, another area. I think a remarkable example of that is the emergence of uh, statistics in, in, in India. Uh, Mahalanovic, who was really a physicist, uh, when he decides to become a statistician, what he is doing is making use of his understanding of mathematical physics to uh, strengthen the basis of mathematical statistics. And it became a major institution of science. I was lucky to see that. I, I knew Mahalan as well. Uh, his family, uh, he was also rather amazingly for an academic he was, uh, uh, in some ways, an academic secretary. Uh, I think that was his term. He was in the last ago. So I often saw him in Santini Ketan. There are lots of pictures of me on his shoulder as a young boy uh, in Santini uh, But there was a, I wasn't learning any mathematical statistics or mathematics at that time time, but fairly early I could have. And in the presidency college atmosphere, there was a fair amount of respect for technicality, along with uh, interest in, 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 in human beings. And the fact that there were uh, and others uh, added to that. I am not sure how exactly it came about, but I think it emerged uh, and there were uh, people who were not teachers, but connected with it. Uh, um, uh, in, in presidency, who had an interest in that, had an interest in economics. And it seemed quite natural to go in that direction. So presidency went on to uh, demand that its students learn from that if they were to do economics in a way that Cambridge they wouldn't consider for at least another 10 or 15 more years. So I think that probably is one of the 
features. And I think the good thing is about it is that it didn't lead to the neglect of the human aspect of economics. That was still quite strong. And, and uh, you mentioned Tafosa, Tafosa himself is a good example of I think, both the uh, sides of it, the technical side and the human side within his uh, uh, area of involvement and expertise. There is another contrast between presidency and Cambridge that strikes me is that the methods of teaching in the two institutions were different. I, I imagine that in presidency, you were largely taught through lectures, some outstanding lecturers, Bhavatos Dotto, Tapos Mojumdar, UN Ghoshal. But in Cambridge, I have good reasons to believe that you were taught through tutorials. So what is, how did it strike you, this contrast, these different ways of teaching? And you are a teacher at heart, which is your preferred mode of teaching? The tutorial system or the, the lecture, you know, as we say, is a sage on a stage? You see, I think the problem with the tutorial system is that you're very lucky with a tutor. You can, you can be very, very lucky indeed. On the other hand, if you're unlucky with your tutor, then you may end up uh, learning a lot of things of no great interest uh, to you or to anyone else. No, I think there are advantages and difficulties involved. The lecturing system has the advantage that you can uh, make a point that should be jointly that should be understood by a great many people. Uh, you can do it together. I remember when I was a young lecturer at, uh, uh, at the Delhi School of Economics. I enjoyed the fact that the same kind of concern, the same kind of worry, the same kind of even confusion that comes in the mind of many people could be addressed together. And there was something quite satisfactory in the fact that at the end of the class, you could think of the fact that there, here's 25 people who seem to have uh, got something out of the lecture that you are trying to get. On the other hand, this doesn't have the merit of the personal attention that the Cambridge or Oxford tutorial system uh, has. And uh, I, uh, I like that too. Uh, uh, ideally, you should combine that. And in what the Americans have tried to do is to make great use of something in between tutorial and lecture, namely um, discussion seminar or classes, classes where uh, six, seven, eight people may together interact. Uh, and when I first went to Harvard, uh, I was teaching a course called Moral Reasoning in Philosophy. And I had, I think about three or 400 students, but that came uh, in, I don't know, 35, 40, section and each section had its own class partly taught by the uh, teaching fellows but partly also uh, strengthened by the lecture himself or herself being there so I, I I wouldn't go for one of them as being superior to the other I can see the merit of each of them. And one wishes that it is possible to combine the two together in some way. So staying with presidency for a little bit, you in the section on 
presidency, you write that uh, even though you were very close to the student federation as a student in presidency, you very quickly came to the conclusion that you couldn't be a member of any political party that demanded conformity. Uh, and, but, and this is where I want you to come in. In Cambridge, two of your mentors, if I can use the word, one of them, Maurice Dobb, a lifelong member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, and uh, Joan Robinson, who was also pretty doctrinaire and known for her volatile temper or sh show displays of intolerance, which you re uh, recollect in one, in one incident. Uh, did you feel any conflict in this, that your views and their views on political activity were so much apart that you didn't want conformity and two of them, at least Dobb at least, was a doctrinaire Marxist? Uh, Dobb might have been doctrinaire Marxist. Marxist he certainly was, um, but he was a much more open-minded guy than John Robinson was. There's no question about that. Uh, well, he's always a member of the Communist Party. I think I quoted uh, a, a conversation <laughs> he had with Dennis Robertson. Dennis Robertson, yes. <laughs> when Dennis Robertson, with a conservative economist, a very good one, who offered the job to Dobb, and Dobb accepted it at Trinity. But when he went home, he said, well, maybe I should have mentioned I'm a member of the Communist Party. And he should have known that before offering me the job. That, by the way, is not a, a evidence of, um, of, of, of uh, doctrinaire thinking. Uh, he is very liberal thinking. So he sent a letter to Dennis Robertson saying, uh, I should have told you when you offered me the job that I will remember the party. And if you think after considering that, that you'd like to withdraw your offer to me to be a teacher in Trinity, I will not hold it against you. I did ask him later, why the hell did he say you will not hold it against him? Uh, you should have held it against him. Be that as it may, he sent a letter and got a one-line reply from uh, Dennis Robertson saying, Dear Dom, so long as you give us a fortnight's notice before blowing up the chapel, it will be all right. Now that indicated a, a certain level of liberality of thought, which um, Dennis Robertson had which was a dog also had. I don't think John Robinson quite had that. Uh, she was very much a proselytizing economist from a certain point of view to be widely understood. And, uh, and I think it's aimed at that. Safa told me in one of the early classes that I want to, you have to bear in mind you have now come to a place, namely Cambridge, where no one thinks a theory is complete until that theory has been converted into a slogan. And I think John Robinson was a great sloganizer in a way Dog never was, and Theo Schaffer never was right. So I don't know that I had a big tension there, but my point isn't so much that people would be very keen on on uh, uh, conformity. Uh, I think the party had the Communist Party. I thought at that time had a feature which has uh, quite uh, uh, powerful, namely that thinking about uh, so-called. Volker liberty. 
that couldn't be important because World War V won't the liberty of a certain cut and that uh, is all right for a world war society but it's not all right for a uh, for the general public now a kind of strong belief of that kind uh, uh, could actually be a major barrier to thinking I actually discuss in the book uh, a debate between Gramsci and Pierre Saffer on that subject, uh, where they, they disagree. Uh, Gramsci, as a, uh, as a founder of the Italian Communist Party, uh, was quite skeptical of World War Liberty, whereas Saffer took a very different point of view on that. So I, I, I wouldn't say that I had a great tension in that. And I was a, a member of the Socialist Club, which is uh, quite close to the to communist thinking. Uh, on the other hand, not quite communist thinking. And that suited me quite well. So one, well, two more issues I want to raise before we uh, wrap up. One is you very deliberately early on in the book point to two very contrasting areas of your work. One is abstract thinking, what we call abstract thinking, largely mathematical and technical. And the other is dealing with the empirical realities of life. So, uh, you draw a contrast and you say, these two have been concerns of yours since actually your school days in Shantini. I want to ask you if somewhere, I'm sure you have thought about this somewhere, uh, your immersion in the thoughts of Gautam Buddha serve as a bridge between these two concerns. Because Buddha is also a school days interest that you develop and you have maintained right to your life. So do you think Buddha forms the link between abstract thinking and the empirical reality of the world? It's a very exciting question and a subject on which I should think more, but I haven't yet. Uh, it's possible. Uh, Buddha had, as you mentioned, the feature of the abstraction, certainly. Uh, and yet, whenever it comes to uh, practical issues, it's a question of relief of the poor. It's a question of inequality that society has, uh, each of which, and particularly caste inequality, and particularly uh, the horror like untouchability, which is already beginning to emerge in the fifth century BC. So I think um, there was there were these two features. Now you're right on both the points that uh, Buddha was a very strong influence on my thinking. It isn't mentioned, but the only picture of my college room in Trinity uh, has a uh, Burmese uh, Buddha uh, in the middle of the table, uh, which some people had noticed. And in fact, my uh, uh, editor wondered whether I should identify it. I said, no, I didn't want to identify it. But people who know will know that it is with uh, uh, and, and certainly he was very strong in my mind. And it's also true that he had interest in, in a way that I could have easily been inspired by of abstract thinking on one side and very concrete interest in particularly the uh, suffering 
that human being have as a result of inequality and, and, and those features. Um, did one influence my involvement with Dada? It's a very good question. I'd like to think about it. <laughs> Thank you, Amutada. You've made my day. One last question, and I'll preface it with an anecdote with which you are familiar. Uh, the two elder daughters of Marx, Karl Marx, uh, were very fond of playing drawing room games with their father. And in the course of one of their games, uh, Jenny, uh, the second daughter, uh, asked Marx a series of questions. Uh, the game was called Confessions. And two of the questions there were, uh, what is your life's maxim and what is your life's motto? And you know the answers Marx gave, life's maxim, he said, nothing alien is, nothing human is alien to me. And life's motto, he said, doubt everything. Have you had any overriding mottos or maxims in your life? One is very clear from the book, that is hope in humanity. But other than that, have you had any other mottos or maxims that uh, strike you as worth recollecting or telling us? I wish I had, yeah. I think there are people with good systematic mind who not only know their own mind well, like in this case, Marx did, but can also put them in a way that's uh, systematic and, uh, and, and communicable in a way that Marx succeeded in doing. Uh, I wish I had those talents. I don't think I do have. I, if somebody asked me about my maxim or motto, uh, my inclination would be to say that. I don't have any such thing because I, <laughs> I, I seem to be insubsistent uh, in these matters and uh, cannot claim to have uh, adhered to uh, some grand maxim or huge motto. Uh, but, uh, We are coming here close to something that Safa was teaching me to avoid, namely a slogan, because a maxim and a motto very often sounds like a slogan. And the two that you gave example from Marx's un answer to his daughter uh, have some slogan-like features. So I might have been somewhat skeptical uh, about that. And it's good. I admire Marx's ability to answer this in a way that it seemed to uh, go beyond uh, the use of children. There is some really interesting point that he is making. At least so it seems to me right now. Uh, it may not, if I were to critically think, I may find something mistaken about this. But I take this opportunity of mentioning, since you have been very kind in drawing attention to a variety of features from which I have benefited. And one of them is to be able to learn from someone and remain critical out of the thinking of the same person. Marx is a very good example of that. I learned an enormous amount from Marx, and yet uh, there remain points of strong resistance where I couldn't give in to Marx. Right? And that in a sense, is a part of the book. It's the 
ไม่มีเลยไม่มีเลยตรงไหนเลยแต่เธอเธอคงจะไม่ต้องดีเราก็ติดคง I care I care for them America and India and Pakistan and Bangladesh but they also going to talk uh, and last year big contributor to the world need of me which uh, which came from the reading itself and that's one of the reasons why I think that uh, it would be a mistake to think of Maurice Dodd as a slogan adherent to think well, sir, Thank you for your very precious time. I know how busy you are. So uh, I will now hand over to Shonanarath Mukherjee, the immediate past president under whose presidency this event was actually conceived of. But before I hand it over to him, it will amuse you to know that Shomendranath's mother, Lily, gets a mention in your memoirs. The girl from Urissa who was on the ship <laughs> on your first voyage out. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So, Shomendranath. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's a small uh, world, very small world. <laughs> it yeah. is home in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, my privilege and honor uh, to give the vote of thanks uh, for today's session. Professor Sen, I have been a fan of yours from the day I joined Presidency College to read economics honors. I was a year junior to Obijit Binayak Banerjee and Quite often, we found ourselves discussing you at the coffee house and the Presidency College uh, canteen. And this is purely on a personal note because I have been an avid follower of your writings, your lectures, including the one you delivered in Cambridge in 1983 autumn. I was there with Anuradha, that's Prahlad Basu's son, our daughter. Yes, I am. And uh, let me tell you, Professor Sen, your writings, lectures, thoughts, theories have inspired more than one generation to recognize protest and fight the inequities that exist in today's world. The intolerance that plagues humanity, the increasing assault on freedom of expression and the divisiveness introduced by identity politics. It was indeed a pleasure and honor to have you speak to the members of the Bengal club and their guests today for this, on behalf of the club and its members, we express our gratitude. And again, on a personal note, I was delighted to find copious reference to my guru in the legal profession, Dipankur Ghosh, in your book. And I think his son is also logged in today. Okay. <laughs> Gopal Gandhi, my namesake, thank you for being here and agreeing to release the book. Kolkata misses you. You truly were a people's governor. And Rudrangshu, a big thank you to you for setting up today's session. You have been an asset to the club and time and again introduced to the club and its members programs, debates, and discussions of high quality. Thank you very much. And lastly, I must thank the Telegraph for giving today's session 
the publicity that it deserved. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Thank you very much.